always takes prudent measures, uh, especially in an, in an environment that they were in tonight. So they did make adjustments. And just, just to be clear on the deconfliction line, you told them that you're going to be operating in airspace, but you didn't tell them the Russians what the uh, what the targets were. That and is then that is absolutely correct. We used a normal deconfliction channels to to deconflict the airspace that we were using. We did not coordinate targets or or any planning with the Russians. What was the response, sir? We pa well, that, that information was passed at the operational link from the Combined Air Operations Center in Qatar, so I wasn't on the line. But we that that kind of information, just to put it in perspective, is passed routinely every day and every night. So they they may not have found anything unusual about that particular airspace deconfliction. Thank you so much, uh, Katrina Manson from the Financial Times. Can you talk a little bit about uh, any Iran targets that you initially, uh, Iran associated targets that you initially considered and why you may have not gone for them? And could your colleagues explain exactly the sort of contribution that you've made to tonight's operation? Yeah, again, our, our allied officers are here out of respect for the fact that they were part of the mission from planning all the way through to the political decision taken. And once their heads of state uh, speak tomorrow, then uh, that'll be the initial statement from those capitals. But as far as any other targets, we looked at targets specifically designed to address the chemical weapons threat that we have seen manifested. The whole world has watched in horror uh, these weapons being used. Those were the only targets that we were uh, examining for prosecution. Uh, Mr. Secretary and General Dufford, um, you, you mentioned three target areas that were struck. How can you be sure that from now on these are all of the target areas or all of the involved air, um, production facilities for chemical weapons uh, that the Syrians have are using? And do you believe that there are additional locations uh, where, where they are producing such uh, materials? This is a great question. We had a number of targets uh, to select from. And again, uh, we did not select those that had a high risk of uh, collateral damage uh, and specifically a high risk of civilian casualties. And so the weapon airing, you know, back to the earlier question, the weapon airing uh, was done, the modeling was done uh, to make sure that we mitigated the risk of any chemicals uh, that were in those facilities and mitigate the risk of civilian casualties. So were there other targets that we looked at? There were. We selected these specific targets, both based on the significance to the chemical we weapons program, as well as the location and the layout. Thanks. Uh, Secretary Mattis, um, it seems like this strike tonight was pretty limited, not too dissimilar from last year. I know it was three, three targets this time instead of one, but it still seems a little bit more targeted and more specific than what I think a lot of people were expecting. Can you walk us through your decision <coughs> to, uh, did, did, did concern about escalation with Russia affect your decision to keep this more targeted? and? Uh, moving from there, uh, how much assurance can you give us that this is going to do what the strike last year didn't do, which is basically to stop President Assad from from using chemical we weapons nothing, again? Hillary, nothing is certain in uh, in these kinds of matters. However, <clears throat> we used a, a little over double the number of weapons this year than we l used last year. Uh, it was done on targets that we believed were selective. Uh, to hurt the chemical weapons program. We confined it to the chemical weapons type targets. Uh, we were not out to expand this. We were very precise and proportionate, but at the same time, it was a heavy strike. Mr. Secretary, prior to the attack, <clears throat> how important was it to get uh, the support from the allies, not only from an intelligence point of view, but also just from the, from the countries themselves? Uh, it's always important that we act uh, internationally in a unified way over something, especially that is, that is such an atrocity as this uh, that, that we've observed going on in Syria. But I would also tell you that these allies, uh, the Americans, the French, the British, we have operated together through thick and thin, through good times and bad. And uh, this is a very, very well integrated team. Uh, wherever we operate, we do so with complete trust in each other, the professionalism, but more than that, the belief that one another will be there when the chips are down. So uh, it's important and it's a, it's a statement about the level of trust between our nations.
Could you just uh, let us know whether the Syrians were able to hide a lot of these chemical weapons in the last several days, since there's been so much talk about a possible strike? Did that give the Syrians time to kind of move some of these weapons off limits? Off limits. And then Secretary Mattis, just to confirm earlier when you were saying you had information about one of the chemicals, but we're all assuming that means chlorine, that you had uh, information uh, confirming chlorine, but not necessarily sarin. If you could just clarify that part. Yeah, Phil, the first question. I'm not aware of any specific actions that the Syrians took to move uh, chemical weapons in the last couple of days. Yeah, we're, we're very confident that, that chlorine was used. Uh, we are not ruling out sarin right now. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, General, I'd like to follow up on Lewis's question about the targets that you first examined and then uh, triaged down to the three tonight. Uh, it sounds like you went after facilities and not the actual weapons, as, as indicated earlier, to minimize accidental uh, risk to civilians. Uh, in the targets that remain, could you characterize perhaps the, the ability for Syria to ramp up again and again have chemical weapons? Yeah, I think it's too early to make that assessment. It's too early to make that assessment right now. Thank you. Uh, General Dunford, did any Russian defenses engage U.S., British, or French ships or missiles? And Secretary Mattis, were any of the strikes tonight intended to kill Bashar al-Assad? The, uh, the only reaction that I'm aware of at this time was Syrian surface-to-air missiles. I, I, I happen to be down in the National Command, Military Command Center and was aware of that activity. I'm not aware of any Russian activity, and I'm not aware of the full scope of the Syrian regime response at this time. Again, those will be details we'll pull together for you in the morning. Yeah, the, uh, the targets tonight, again, were specifically designed to degrade the Syrian war machine's ability to create chemical weapons and to, uh, to set that back uh, right now. There were no attempts to broaden or expand that target set. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for coming in this evening. Based on recent experience, we fully expect a significant disinformation campaign over the coming days by those who have aligned themselves with the Assad regime. And in an effort to maintain transparency and accuracy, my assistant for public affairs, Ms. Dana White, and Lieutenant General McKenzie, the director of the Joint Staff here in Washington will provide a brief of known details tomorrow morning. We anticipate about 9 o'clock in this same, uh, same location. But thank you again for coming in this evening, ladies and gentlemen. And we've just been listening to a live briefing from the Pentagon, Secretary of Defense Jay Mattis and General Joseph Dunford, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, filling us in on the airstrikes, which they say is now over. This wave of airstrikes is over. It lasted about an hour. We do have Seth Jones standing by. Seth, are you hearing any more uh, strikes? We've heard from the we've heard from the Pentagon. It should be over. Uh, th that's right, Tanya. We've been, I've been listening to the Pentagon briefing in my ear and out the other ear listening to uh, the airstrikes. Around the time that General Dunford had said uh, that they had stopped, we were not hearing any more. From time to time, we hear some sort of a rumbling in the distance, but no longer those large booms that we were hearing, those very strong, almost sounded like thunderous uh, booms as uh, we were hearing that in those incoming airstrikes. It has been uh, a quite a morning here though watching uh, both anti-aircraft fire and flares uh, going through the sky also hearing those incoming airstrikes and in between that we've heard uh, cars driving up and down one in particular playing a patriotic music there is a, a sense of defiance here we were meeting with very high level uh, one minister other people who are very high level in the government today and they were saying Syrians have uh, fought through history have been fighting for this last seven plus year war and the gentleman in, in the government told us he said if there's only one Syrian left they will fight for Syria to the last a drop of blood so a, a real sense of a defiance even ahead of these strikes here uh, we were also getting a sense of disbelief for a while as we were on the streets in in Damascus people were telling us that they didn't really believe that the the president president Trump would follow through with these strikes it was a very calm day today uh, but today as Saturday dawns actually 
dawn is coming. The light is just coming over the horizon. Now people are waking up with very new questions as to will we see this war escalate? Uh, that, that we will have to, to wait and see, Tanya. Well, uh, Seth, we heard General Dunford talk about the three main targets of this mission. Could you sense from where you were standing how far away you were from any of those targets? You could hear that there were targets around Damascus, for sure. I mean, Holmes is a several-hour drive. That was one of the targets where one of the military research centers are. You would, uh, you would not be able to hear that. But certainly, uh, targets around Damascus, uh, that's, what we were, that's what we were hearing in strike. We were also hearing anti-aircraft uh, fire, and we were learning from Syrian state TV that the air defenses for Damascus, for Syria, were working on overdrive. Syrian state TV was reporting that 13 missiles in the Kizwa area uh, were shot out of the sky. Uh, obviously, if that uh, proves to be true, that would be uh, some uh, level of, of pride there uh, for the Syrians who said that their uh, anti-aircraft uh, defenses were working in overdrive. We had heard reports through the week of some moving around of military hardware, uh, and one of the things that had been put in place uh, reportedly were these different air defense systems. Uh, now, the Pentagon, as you heard in the briefing, was very careful to say <coughs> that these were uh, not civilian targets, that these were, uh, in, the, in the words of, of the U.S. military, very carefully chosen military targets meant to degrade the ability for uh, the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and his government to develop any sort of, of chemical weapons. And we're also hearing reports that many of the targets, in particular the air bases and some of the military installations that had been struck, had indeed been evacuated of personnel earlier in the week. Seth, thank you so much. We will be coming back to you. But right now, I want to go to CBS News Radio military analyst Mike Lyons. Mike, thank you so much for sticking with us. We just heard from the Pentagon that this wave of airstrikes is over. Does that mean the mission is over? I think the president left that uh, door wide open. I think they're going to look at battle damage assessment. They're going to measure what uh, the Assad government does. I mean, I don't believe they'll go ahead and fire a chemical weapon tomorrow. That would just be crazy for them to do that. Um, but it looks like this attack did get more capability. It went after facilities. It went after places where they're actually still manufacturing some of that chlorine gas. And that you know, he's stuck in there about command and control headquarters. I'm, I'm seeing that's a Republican guard. So that's going to take out some of his ground capability. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more of what happened than the last time. And we've added the British and the French to it. Um, there's no question it's been a ratcheted up response. We heard from General Dunford that there were three main targets this time. Can you elaborate on those a little bit? Yeah. So if you think one of them was an airfield. So similar mm -hmm. to what we did last time. So we took you know, kind of one of the military air bases out. The second one was that control facility of where they store chemical weapons and where they're actually still manufacturing them. So the, it's, it's dangerous to, to deal with these things. And, and to get them into helicopters, to handlers, they've got to be careful about them. And then that third facility was that storage facility and command and control. And that's those ground Republican Guard units, which right. I think is kind of going outside that boundary. Now, the reason why they struck them is because they knew full well that there wouldn't be Russian soldiers there. He said they didn't give a heads up to the Russians. Right. That was interesting. He said they had been in communication, but right. there was no... There was no uh, advance notification to the Russians. And, and that's because that elite unit, for whatever's left of them, of that Syrian military force, wouldn't want Russians around them. That's right. really how that would work. Now, they also, uh, the Pentagon officials also went into some detail about the differences between this attack versus the attack a year ago. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on, on, we understand there were more weapons used this time. Yeah, they used the manned aircraft. And I'm also seeing reports of, you know, coming from Qatar, if, if those aircraft flew over, Iraqi airspace, for example, that, that now sends a message from the Iraqi government to the Iranian government uh, on some level as to what, right. whose side they're on, because you'd have to get permission to do those kinds of things. But this, this one came from all different directions. I think the last time um, the attack coming from the Mediterranean, coming from those naval platforms, pretty much in one direction, this one came from a few different directions, which was more of a test to their system. So we're, we're also trying to see what that air defense platform is like. It was just really installed last November there coming from Russia. And at one point, the previous administration thought that, that it was so good that we wouldn't be able to do this. We wouldn't be able to take out their, uh, the, the, these kinds of facilities because right. it was so good. We heard the Defense Secretary Mattis say it was clear that the Assad regime did not get the message last year. Yeah. Let's hope his regime gets the message 
this year. Yeah, it just we, we have to see. You know, if you look through their eyes, that they might actually say, "Wow, they just mm -hmm. took all these risks. They didn't really, you know, didn't really hurt us. We still have that capability. He might still be hanging on." And the bottom line is, as the Russians have come out uh, against the attack. Um, right. Let's it, talk about that because he. Yeah. So first of all, we heard that there have been no U.S. losses yet. Of course, we right. need to make the morning assessment, sure. as uh, General Dunford said. But you did just read a Russian response. Yeah, from Sputnik. It looks like um, the Russians consider this an aggressive act. Mm -hmm. Now they didn't respond uh, while the attack was going on. They really could have. Um, we will we'll find out whether or not some of those uh, missiles either knocked some of our cruise missiles out or. You know, it landed someplace, missed something. They could have, they could have targeted some Navy ship destroyer out there in the Mediterranean and just missed it. Right now, we're going to go to Ed O'Keefe for a moment to talk about the congressional response. Ed O'Keefe, are you with us? I am, Tanya. So, Ed, what are you hearing from Congress? I mean, we've seen a couple of tweets. One from Senator Bob Casey, you know, sort of saying, "While Bashar al-Assad must be held accountable for his unlawful use of chemical weapons against civilians, the strikes that are being carried out are being done without a congressional authorization." Are you hearing other uh, lawmakers there complain about this? You know, we've seen a, a few Democrats certainly raise those concerns, Tanya. Uh, we know that congressional leaders were informed tonight by the vice president formally of the airstrikes. He was calling them from Peru, where he's attending the Summit of the Americas. Uh, of them, only House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi has weighed in so far, calling on Congress to pass a fresh war authorization for the president to use to justify these attacks. In a statement, she said in part, and I quote, one night of airstrikes is not a substitute for a clear, comprehensive, serious strategy, unquote. You mentioned Bob Casey, another Democratic senator, Tim Kaine of Virginia, <sighs> said in a tweet tonight that the president's decision is, quote, illegal. We need to stop giving presidents a blank check to wage war. Today it's Syria, but what's going to stop him from bombing Iran or North Korea next, unquote. But Kaine is working with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Bob Corker of Tennessee on legislation that would enact a new authorization for the use of military force. On Capitol Hill, they call it an AUMF, mm -hmm. uh, the initials. Corker and Kane have been working on this. It would enact the first new AUMF since the 9-11 era. Mm -hmm. Among other things, it would be renewed every four years. Congress would have the right to review the addition of any new terrorism groups to a list of targeted organizations, and there's some other changes. Keynes have faced the nation guest on Sunday and undoubtedly may have a little more detail to share on this if we don't learn it sooner. Uh, but this was in the works this week, and then, of course, the attacks came tonight, mm -hmm. and Democrats reiterating their opposition. Republicans, however, loyal to the president, still pretty supportive. The House right. Majority Leader tonight saying, quote, the barbarism from the Assad regime will not be tolerated. America and its allies are together to deliver the consequences from such heinous action. All right. Well, Ed, stick with us for a second. I want to ask Mike, because in the absence of an AUMF, what is the legal standing here? <laughs> is what the president did tonight legal? Yeah, it, there's going to be so, two sides to that. Some will say not. Some will say it is. But the Constitution does give the president authorization to go to war. But the War Powers Act really limits him from staying at war. So with the next 48 hours, he has to notify Congress of this. Um, and then he's got to withdraw those troops within 60 days without that AUMF. And to, to the point before, uh, we're still working off the same AUMF from what happened uh, back in 9-11 days. I mean, we've got soldiers inside of Syria, for example, uh, which had nothing to do with the 9-11 attack. So uh, this is where Congress really has not done their job and has not you know, stepped up and gotten to the, to the president because they really don't want to go out on a limb. The, le the previous administration, when Obama wanted to strike um, Syria, Congress uh, didn't want to vote on it. They didn't want to give them that authorization. Right. So at this point, Ed, do you do you sense that this is enough of an issue for congressional Democrats that they're going to press this point? This, in addition to everything else, Tanya, yes. I, I think, you know, this has been bubbling under the surface uh, really since the Trump administration began. And frankly, it would have been bubbling to, underneath the surface uh, if somebody else had become president, because there are a number of lawmakers in both parties who have been saying for years that there needs to be a new authorization established because, you know, al-Qaeda really doesn't exist the way it did uh, 17 years ago. Uh, you know, with ISIS being the focus, that, that organization has never been codified into one of these types of laws. Uh, they say it's time to do this. And Republicans generally, uh, if reluctantly, perhaps agree that mm -hmm. that is the case. That and that's why you've seen the cooperation 
uh, especially on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, to try to get to work on this. And, and we've anticipated, uh, based on work that was being done this week, that uh, perhaps by next week we'll see language and some plans to actually move on. It was a topic of conversation at the beginning of the confirmation hearing on Thursday for Mike Pompeo, mm -hmm. where members of the committee agreed that they would get back to this next week. So if that's it, if this military action lasted all of an hour, and that's, we're done. Does the president even have to go to Congress at all over this? Oh, no, he still does because does. military forces were used. Mm -hmm. uh, pilots put in harm's way and they were deployed. So and at the end of the day, we did launch missiles into a sovereign country. So he's got to report military forces were in play. All right. We're also, we just want to play an earlier, um, some of the president's sound earlier when he announced um, action. He included a message to Russia. Let's listen in. I also have a message tonight for the two governments most responsible for supporting, equipping, and financing the criminal Assad regime. To Iran and to Russia, I ask, what kind of a nation wants to be associated with the mass murder of innocent men, women, and children? The nations of the world can be judged by the friends they keep. No nation can succeed in the long run by promoting rogue states, brutal tyrants, and murderous dictators. In 2013, President Putin and his government promised the world that they would guarantee the elimination of Syria's chemical weapons. Assad's recent attack and today's response are the direct result of Russia's failure to keep that promise. And CBS News State Department reporter Kylie Atwood is in Washington and joins us. Kylie, very strong words directed at President Putin, Russian President Putin, at Russia. We know from the response in Sputnik right now that there have been some equally strong words uh, against President Trump this evening. What are you hearing? Yes, yeah, so I think it's important to note what President Trump noted there, which is in 2013, Russia did agree to rid Syria of chemical weapons. And in 2014, actually, Secretary of State then John Kerry uh, said that 100 percent of the chemical weapons were out of Syria. Clearly, that's not the case. We have seen chemical weapons used time and time again since he made that statement. But what is being demonstrated today is that the U.S. no longer longer trust Russia to be the ones who are determining if Syria has chemical weapons or not because they continue to use these chemical weapons. And so what is important to note here is that amid kind of the awful U.S.-Russia relations that have been deteriorating over the past year or so, the U.S. no longer trusts Russia to be kind of, uh, to hold it to its promise here. And so that's why they're going after these sites that they say the Syrians are using to develop these chemical weapons. Right. Kylie, thank you so much. I just want to point out that in the report that's coming from Russian media, Mm -hmm. Alexander Sheeran, the first deputy chairman of the State Duma Defense Committee, called President Trump not just a criminal for the whole world, he is Adolf Hitler number two. So <laughs> clearly the rhetoric is uh, ratcheting up on both sides. Kylie, thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to go back to Mike Lyons, CBS Radio military analyst. Um, so, Mike, what do you make of this Russian?